Welcome to episode 29 of the Sumer Sports Show. Uh, I'm Eric Eager. I'm VP of Research and Development at Sumer Sports. I'm joined by Thomas Dimitrov, the CEO of Sumer Sports. And according to a, a random uh, security guard at Super Bowl Radio Row, the person who has, quote, the best hair here, Thomas Dimitrov. Thomas, I had, I, I got to say, like, you know, the people talk about football and everybody's like, oh, you know, I want a job in football and all this and I want a job in media and I want and I think a lot of people are like, you know, a lot of people who are in media in football, they'll say, hey, it's harder, right, than than it looks. I have to say, though, this week going to Super Bowl Radio Row, hanging out with you, getting to talk on air with people like Jim Rome and uh, your guy uh, Pharrell and, and things like that. I genuinely had a really fun time this week, and I and I really thought that uh, it was an enjoyable time going to spread the gospel of Sumer and, and just getting to talk team building with you. So uh, I'm I'm glad that we're home. I'm glad that I get to sleep in my own bed. But it was a lot of fun this week. That was, it was a lot of fun. High energy. I mean, look, everyone out there, don't don't let uh, Eric be so uh, humble here. I mean, he kicked massive butt over there, and I think what happened is there were people that were interested in talking to me to see if I would have some sort of a slip up now that my, you know, I'm no longer working for the Falcons. They can like hit me with, you know, GM stuff that might not be talked about otherwise, but they quickly turned to Eric and talked to him about, you know, the combination of knowledge he has with football, of course, as well as his big brain regarding, you know, all the great things analytical out there. I just thought it was a really good mix, Eric. I was really happy with the way things played out. We got, you know, if, if you want to, I don't even know if this is the time to talk about it, but suffice it to say a lot of really cool coverage during that time. I didn't know we were going to have that much, you know, that much coverage, to be honest with you. Yeah. And a shout out to our, our friend and also our you know colleague in this situation, Matt Stopsky, who uh, works at Sirius Satellite Radio, uh, you know, with our, our friend Salma Wilcox, my former colleague at Pro Football Focus. Um, he did a really good job. I mean, he, he filled this up with a bunch of hits Tuesday and Wednesday, but then, you know, there were like these 15 minute pockets where you and I thought we had a break and Matt's like, no, no, you, you're going on with this Philadelphia station. You're going on with this Pittsburgh station. And, you know, he, it was truly uh, good. And to the point where like Wednesday night, you know, I had a bunch of friends who were like, Hey, you come out for drinks and stuff. And I'm like, no, I'm too tired to, and, you know, and I had to, we had to fly back. Cause of course uh, you know, we, we had to do the work of Sumer sports, but uh, you know, for most of our week uh, you know, on the B2B and the B2C side. So it was just really enjoyable. And, and, Um, It was cool to see, you know, obviously, you know, Michael Silver, you know, somebody that that you've known for a long time and Mm -hmm. Peter King, who uh, I I think about this, like growing up, I used to watch those NFL team highlight videos and they were hosted by Michael Silver and Peter King like 30 years ago. And now, of course, you know, we get to talk to them about football and and in many ways, you know, the game has changed a lot, but some of the faces have stayed the same for a long time. Uh, I thought it was really cool, um, you know. People are very interested in what we're doing. I think analytics is on everybody's mind. And this gets us to kind of what happened last night when, you know, Philadelphia Eagles faced the Kansas City Chiefs. You know, we had a tweet that actually, you know, uh, my friend Courtney Cronin, you know, well, she was on Around the Horn, talked about, you know, Nick Sirianni being really good in the fourth down decisions, the, the delay of game avoidances, the timeout avoidances. And in the first half of that game, the Philadelphia Eagles had a lead over Kansas City. Um, in large part because Nick Sirianni did all those analytical things. And what I thought was really refreshing was the broadcast, Kevin Burkhart, Greg Olson, Greg Olson, a former tight end. We're going to talk about tight ends today. Mm -hmm. Um, They were attuned to what was going on. They were attuned to the, the fact that the Eagles would run the ball on third and seven because they were going to go for it on fourth and four. And, and I thought, you know, I I had some pride, not necessarily because uh, you know, watching the Eagles and that was a very prideful moment for me, but also, the broadcast, you know, has been is so much brighter now and so much more attuned to some of these things than it was than it was ten years ago. Uh, and because these coaches are forcing through their use of analytics and specifically Sirianni are forcing, uh, you know, the people who bring you the game from a media perspective to be so much more intelligent. And I think you know we at Sumer Sports are right on the forefront, right on the cutting edge of that. We're going to be the the beginning of that traveling wave. Uh, towards you know more intelligent coverage and we saw that this week we were on a bears uh, chgo podcast where we were talking about how the bears should use the first pick and you and i kind of were, were, were you know you and i were on different sides of the argument but i thought it was really cool how you know 10 years ago we just said oh just 
take, you know, take the best defensive end. And now we're sort of thinking about, well, should they trade the pick? Should they take another quarterback? And, and, and I, I don't know about you, but I think about, you know, the way in which this league has evolved and I can't, you know, help but be a little bit proud of where it's gone. Well, let me, let me interject by saying we're on the opposite ends of the world only because I wasn't necessarily sure that they should move on their quarterback and, and you're still undecided. We both believe that they should move that pick somewhere or another, depending on how they approach it, of course, which I think is going to be a great conversation as we get into a lot of the draft stuff moving forward, Eric, I think we're going to have some unbelievable conversations. And can I just backtrack one second? Stopsky, you're talking about Matt. We're talking about our, our guy that placed us in all these different places. I'm sorry to go back on this, but I wasn't able to interject. Kick complete ass on it. And if anyone out there, I'm going to give him a plug, big or small in the, in the world of trying to get placed in some of these, you know, with some of these people, like these media people, he's the guy to do it for you. So uh, kudos to him, man. Great, great yeah. bringing him to the camp, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah, he is so plugged in. And, you know, even at pro, when we were at Pro Football Focus, you, you can tell, you know, there, I was always surrounded with such great people that booked me on stuff. Him, Dave Sofaro, they were just, you know, they're guys who know people and they work their, their tails off. And, and you know, I, I don't know if people who aren't in media necessarily appreciate that part where it's really difficult to get, you know, to book your own stuff. And, and, you know, it's really difficult to make those connections. And now obviously through, through your stature in the league, and then my, you know, you know, mine, mine is growing a little bit. Like you, you get some of the people want to come directly to you. And, it, and it's really nice, of course, to have people who are working hard on your behalf. And, and it, he also just knows football, which is really cool. He knows, you know, which people would be receptive, like uh, to, to, you know, my brand of under, you know, my brand of talking about football versus yours. And then who, you know, I thought some of the best hits were the ones obviously where we were on together and we were sort of talking about uh, our various uh, interactions. I, I also thought that the having going on with Scott Farrell separately, the two of us was, was, was really fun. Um, he, I think he even posted a clip about, uh, I told the story about who, how you and I met and how you and I became acquainted as far as, uh, you know, the, the football analytics and our friendship and all that and, and why we're here. Uh, so that was really cool as well. And he's just an absolute character. We got to watch him interview uh, Bears legendary quarterback Jim McMahon right before he interviewed you. And, and that was a, a spectacle uh, of, of, of uh, a sports talk, uh, to say the least. So well, let's 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 review the game, though. Right. So, Thomas, when you're watching that game. You're looking at the Philadelphia Eagles, a, a, a great football team from top to front. Right. Like back to front. And you're and they're they're doing everything right. They're applying their edge. They're getting they're making fourth downs. They're making third downs. I thought Jalen Hurts played as well as we could have ever imagined last night. Yeah. You know, Kansas City, they 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 make some mistakes early. Um, they get behind. And then I have to tell you, I thought the second half, I don't think I've ever seen a guy call plays better than Andy Reid in the second half. And so what mm -hmm. what I think was really cool was that you had a team in the Eagles. They had like 26 first downs and like 12, I think 13 of them, or it was 13 to 24 or something like that. Like a significant part of their their their, their conversions on first downs were on third and fourth down. And then you had Kansas City who was so good calling plays. They only had to convert four third downs the whole night. And when you watch a game like that and it's the biggest stage mm -hmm. and you have the two best teams in football and they both play wonderful football games, I don't think you can be upset with the, you know, and I'm obviously a, you know, a Kansas city fan, but like I, I was, I watched that game and, and I truly would have been okay with either team winning. I, I, I truly would have looked at this and said, we're crowning the best team in the NFL last night. And, and did you kind of get that? I and mean, what were your takeaways from the game? Yeah, I would just, I would just say, I went in there thinking that how he had an edge with that team, as far as I'm talking about the Howie Roseman, of course, that mm -hmm. the Eagles had an edge just because they had so much momentum going. I knew, and I'm sure everyone who really has, has studied them, those are two, in my mind, those are two best teams in the country, in the NFL, and they were going to play off and it was going to come down to it in the very end. I was, I loved it. I think it was great. I think watching how they were kind of, you know, sort of back and forth, I always love games like that. I mean, I just felt like everyone was, was dialed in. I mean, look, what you know, seeing what Andy did to your point about calling the plays, although he did, he did give Eric Bieniemy massive kudos for that, for one reason or another. Maybe it was was a combination of both of them. I mean, even down on the goal line, 
they were they were they weren't like massively creative, but just what they did, sort of you know drifting in, coming back out on you know back to back touchdowns. One with the receiver, one with the back. Right? Was that the second one? Was a who was the second? Yeah. One? Well, I, it, it's crazy because the Chiefs this year had a, I think a worse percentage of conversion on third and fourth and one than they did on third and fourth or six or more. Yeah. And what was really cool is they they converted all the short yardage stuff. They had the Pacheco running yeah. touchdown. And then both and – and it's actually funny because I've watched this team so much that I saw Kadarius Tony in the game on his first touchdown. And I said, oh, they're going to run the jet sweep to Kadarius Tony, And yeah. they ran it and then faked it. And then he's wide open for a touch. And then – so Andy Reid's got some rube like me, like, mixed up at home watching. Of course, you know, he's got everybody twisted around. And then they – ran the exact same play to Sky Moore, their second round pick this year. And that was Sky Moore's first touchdown. In fact, I think what, one interesting part of this game, Thomas, and you can maybe allude to how difficult this is. There was not a wide receiver that played a snap last night for the Chiefs that played for the team last year. They were all new. And you look and you think that's that, that to me, that's coaching, right? That's acclimating players. That's, that's front office acquiring players who will fit. And knowing that, and that's the quarterback being so good that he can, of course, overcome uh, you know some of the inconsistencies across the roster, and 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 to be able to run that kind of stuff against a great defense shows to me coaching and and, and like a a sort of special nature to to basically the whole org there. Yeah, I mean, just to just to piggyback off of that, there is there is no question that they came in, as you know, dialed in. I mean, watching you know watching Mahomes get injured. And I thought right away, I thought if I were to be on the defensive side, you know, I'd be going and, and, and chipping away a little bit at the lower level, not, not, not to hurt someone, but just to let them know that you're there. And man, he, he jumped back up. Who knows what happened at halftime. They came back out and man, I just, I just was so impressed with it. And as I am with that organization, even at the end, I don't, I, I don't want to get away from us here, but watching, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, watching Clark Hunt and Andy Reid and, and Brett Veach, even though I want to say I, I get mad at guys and pissed off at guys like Terry Bradshaw that don't mention the GM, right? They mention mm -hmm. Andy and, and, and of course, you know, of course, quarterbacks. And you, you, got, you, you got the best tight end in the country making uh, all kinds of noise like he always does. And there's Brett Veach in the back there mention the GM because he's been such an important part yeah. to that. And this has always been something that's been on my mind, not, not, not for any other reason, but they put their heart and soul into it as well. And I just, I felt like he needed to be, a, um, you know, he needed to be um, kudo, you know, give him. But you think about this, you think about this, Thomas, the Chiefs are six to one to win the Super Bowl next year. Yeah. They were about that in December this year, five to one, I think is, and, and, and I, it is, it is a general, that was a general, who, who traded for Kadarius Tony in the middle of the season? Like right. that was Brett Beach, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and, Brett Veach has done this, right? Like he has, he traded for, uh, or he signed Josh Gordon. He, he signed Emmanuel Agba. He traded, yeah. he signed DeAndre Baker. He traded for Frank Clark. He's always gone after these like high end draft picks that other teams thought were failures. And they've all kind of, now they all, not that many have hit hit like Kadarius did last night, but he's got a process. He puts it in place. And I, and I got to say, like, and, and we're giving flowers on you know, Mike Borgonzi, the assistant GM, the sure. GP of football, admin Brant Tillis, who, you know, writes all the, con you know, does the contracts. And, and I got another one. You got a guy like, like Ted Cruz. And I'm saying this, yeah. the best, the best communications head of media, yeah. VP of media in the country, the way that he deals with everything that has gone down there through the years where things were pretty rocky, as you know, when, 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 you know, a, God rest his soul, suicide happens all the way through. I mean, to even keep things in order during a lot of really funky times, because as you know, what the Chiefs have done as well, brother, is they have taken guys that have not passed the, the sort of Kool-Aid acid test for a lot of teams per character, right? But of course, Andy Reid knows that he can bring people in there and he can work with them. He can keep them in line, just like Bill Belichick can, right? But you have to give kudos to the people at the top of the organization like Ted Cruz to keep things in order. Yeah. I, and I'm not, I'm not just riffing off on something else. It's very important. Any of you rising execs, you make sure you get a stud in that position working for you. If you become a GM or a head coach, man, it is so important for that guy to, to, to rock a great understanding of making sure that the right information's out there. Yeah. And, and the, 
and the thing, yeah, and you, you know, this is an organization that has lost people, right? Like you, you're talking about, you know, guys like Cruz and and Pratillis and like those guys have been there. You know, even um, Ryan Poles, he they were hired by the Pioli regime, right? They they stuck through the and those were tough times at the end, and then they they you know and, and everybody talks about how Sirianni left after uh, Haley's regime and, and Pioli's regime left. Um, but a lot of those guys sk- stayed. Andy Reid comes in, of course, and they have the you know the five years with Alex Smith that were all really good, but not Super Bowl caliber. Then you have the five years with with Pat Mahomes that were all Super Bowl caliber, and they win two now. And but they won two in two different ways, right? They they've done the phase transition. They've gone from the quarterback on a rookie deal. I actually I, I messaged with somebody in the org today. I was like, this one's special, and he was kind of like, oh, they're all special. I'm like, no, I mean the. It, this is the first team that's won with a quarterback making over 13% of the cap in a long time. Like this is, you are not at a disadvantage necessarily. Cause I, I don't, I don't believe that. I think any team that has Patrick Mahomes is at an advantage, but it's harder of course now when he's making all the money to win than when he wasn't. And so I think this one, you know, is especially so given, especially that you win against a team whose quarterback was making 1.6 million and played every bit the 45 million that Patrick Mahomes plays. And, and again, so you overcome all those things. I don't think you do that just because of one guy. I do think Mahomes is, you know, the best quarterback in the world, but you do that because of a really big organization. And I agree with you. We do need to take a step back and say, you know, Brett Veach built this team and he built this team, you know, he built this team and you say incremental leadership. Like he, when he started as a GM, he was very much backseat to, to Andy Reed. I think he deserves, you know, to be considered now in the front seat, you know, sitting shotgun at worst. And in many cases, driving the car, when you think about, there's no, re, there's no way Andy Reed wanted to trade Tyreek Hill, right? That was very much a front office move for the betterment of the team for the future and for everybody to buy into that move. And, and now you look at the team and they're very, healthy cap wise they're very healthy draft pick wise you look at the composition of ages on their team it it, it, it's this is just the start i think which for many cases when a team wins the super bowl with a quarterback on the rookie deal it's a relief because the window's closing i think the door is just starting to open for this team this was supposed to be the bills year this was supposed to be the chargers year the bengals year and the chiefs sort of sneak in and win a super bowl it to me again yeah, I agree with you. I think it's bad that we don't necessarily give Veach and his team as much credit as maybe they deserve in a situation like this. Great, great um, way to articulate. I mean, as you always do. I mean, let me just finish with with Brett. So what's that? That's two Super Bowls for him as a GM, right? Three appearances, two Super Three, Bowls. Yep. Think, think about this. I mean, maybe that first one, you know, again, ostensibly young. I mean, he's still young. I, I Last time I went through there and interviewed him, he's like, I'm not that young, Thomas. I'm like, well – in the scope of it all, you're you're pretty damn young. Now this year, he continues to grow, and he has more and more presence in the league and more and more respect in the league. I said this to, to Jason Light two years ago, and I know he was so uncomfortable. I said, when you win the Super Bowl, you are literally the best GM in football in the world. And those guys go, oh, no, no, in the world. I mean, right now, Brett Veach, he is until the next season starts, he is the best GM out there, yeah. hands down. And he did it. He did it with a lot of really good people around him. He was at the helm along with Andy, and Andy lets him do stuff. He lets him do all he needs to do to be the GM he can be. And I remember talking to Andy about it. He said, I have the utmost respect in Brett Veach and how he's going to run this organization. And look, we can go on and on about it. He deserves his kudos, and, and, and congratulations, Brett Veach. You completely deserve to be on top of the heap here. Yep, I agree. I think I think when you when you win when Mahomes is young – Everybody can say, "Oh, that's an e- that's a cheat." I think when you win this Super Bowl with this roster and the moves that they made, uh, I think it's unequivocal that the that the general manager and his team uh, deserve. Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's every bit real. Uh, you know, and and there's no there's no there's no if ands or buts about it in this case. And so, congratulations to the Chiefs, a very well deserved, and, and congratulations to the Eagles. Look, the Eagles are a very good football team, and as I said at the beginning of this whole thing, if they would have won. Uh, I think they would have been very deserving and, and there are plenty of really good people in that building. And I think that they will, they will, they'll be back at some point soon. I I mean, they went through, they went through hell and back and they've been in the five years between their first Super Bowl appearance and their second one in this regime. And, and, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that they're built uh, to last, especially in that, in that conference. So um, we saw two great tight ends last night too. We saw Dallas Goddard, uh, former South Dakota state, a Jack rabbit, 
We saw Travis Kelsey, a former UC Bearcat, uh, probably you know one of the best tight ends in football uh, history. Um, we're going to talk about tight ends. It's going to continue our series where we've been talking about, um, you know, basically, you know, evaluating every position a couple weeks ago. It was actually our most popular episode ever, Thomas, which was wide receivers and how to, sort of how to construct the, the the wide receiver core. We talked about your uh, Falcons in 2016, which had Julio Jones, Aldrick Robinson, Mohamed Sanu, and Taylor Gabriel uh, helping Matt Ryan win an MVP. Let's talk tight end, Thomas. Okay making that transition here um you you've had an interesting career of evaluating tight ends and also acquiring them right so when you um when you joined and and when you were in new england right you had what daniel graham you had benjamin watson which by the way benjamin watson is the lowest key four four tight end in the history of the nfl right like when you look at his like combine stuff like he ran a four four and like i don't like that's like the most surprising because that was right right there during the time when Vernon Davis ran a four three nine or four three six or something like that, and then there was you know Matt Jones ran a four three seven that tall thing from Arkansas and all this stuff, and like Benjamin Watson was this like pretty productive NFL tight end that was really fast coming out of Georgia, and no one knew it. You guys, you drafted those two guys. You drafted Daniel Thomas uh, out of Texas after he had a really mm-hmm. uh, big. Uh, 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 college football playoff game. Everybody remembers Vince Young against USC that year, but Daniel Thomas had like 10 catches in that game. And then, uh, and then you left and then you traded for Tony Gonzalez. You drafted uh, Leboy and Toyolo as well as uh, Austin Hooper. And then you traded for Hayden Hurst. So you've had like the whole gamut of, of tight end evaluations. What would you say from your perspective at the position? Do you, um, you know, what, what, what's the first thing that you look for? Wow, there's a lot there because I, I I will say it goes all the way back to, yes, time with Bill Belichick talking and Scott Pioli, you know, at the, at the core of all of our meetings, how important tight ends were, right? And I've mentioned to you before, high percentage shot. There's just such creativity if you get good ones. And we'll talk a lot about it in today's podcast. But when I, when I was there, it goes all the way back to my dad, who was an offensive mind as a, as a coach at my of Ohio and different places and in the CFL and such. And I always remember his words of making sure that you had a bona fide tight end to me, to make sure that when you didn't have that opening on your receivers and look, we still had Julio Jones, but we brought Julio Jones in, in after we had already traded for Tony Gonzalez, which besides Michael Turner, that was, that was the biggest free agent we had ever picked up. Of course. I mean, sorry for pulling them from your team, But it was such an important pick for us. I mean, because it allowed Matt Ryan at the core, again, all the rising execs, the ability to bring a quarterback along, not only with a really stout running back like Michael in that situation, but also a guy that could turn around and put those big old white gloved hands. Remember that. Every time he turned around, Tony Gonzalez put those hands out there and you're like, you are not missing with this cat. So taking that kind of pressure off of a young budding quarterback to me I think is the way to go hands down and, and a lot of other things involved there. When we start on, when we start talking about, um, we start talking about tight ends. You ask me, what do I think? I mean, look in, in our league, by the way, just so everyone knows, go down to the basics here. When we're writing up tight ends for our GMs and for our head coaches and et cetera, et cetera, we are always differentiating between an F at least for most of us, F being the move type tight end, mm-hmm. Right. The Pitts guys, and, and and it's funny, you know, even Tony Gonzalez had some F to him and he had some Y to him, right? So, mm-hmm. and then the other side of the of the coin, of course, is the Y tight end, right? The stout, heavy-legged, blocking guy, heavy-legged. We we create these words, by the way. I know they're not the most mm-hmm. intelligent use of words, but in our own uh, lexicon, it's kind of funny. But, but what you also do when you're evaluating tight ends, which is really, really important, is we are, we are big in describing them, but no tight end is just an F or no tight end is just a Y. If they are, then that's how we grade them. If they have a slash ability to them and they're more F, but they also have five Y, five being adequate, then we will write them as a, an F slash Y or a Y slash F if they're much more blocking. And every once in a while, they can get in that underneath down and out situation and they're solid as a receiver, then we, we end up slashing these guys with our write-ups. So 
I'm a big believer in, remember this, and everyone I think probably knows this if they study tight ends. When you get a tight end that has marquee F ability, movement ability, but also can, can be situated as a blocker, as a, again, using our, our, our verbiage, a six or a good blocker, you have a potential first rounder. When one of the others there, it might be a little less, although we can bring back, you know, Atlanta's pick. He's not a blocker. Pitts is a, one of the best athletes to ever come out, of course, which I love athletic tight ends. But, of course, his blocking is something that needs to be worked on. So just let me bring it back to you. But I'm a, I want a nice athletic tight end who can move, who can adjust, who has, you know, anticipatory ability. Remember, this is something that Bill Belichick, taught us from the very beginning. You can't have a dumb tight end. Ergo, Eric Eager playing tight end coming out, right? You have to have smart people in that spot. So I would say if you get that and you get a guy that also can satisfact in a satisfactory ma manner, block, get in the way, turn his butt to the hole, wall off, seal, that's a big enough issue for a defense to deal with along with a guy who can get out and make plays in the, in the pass game, of course. Yeah, it's so. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, and and I was a very myself a very limited player. I was you know a better blocker than I was a receiver, and like I I, I but I had like you know movement and you know, could play H and stuff like that. And we called it H, but like you know that fullback kind of spot, you know type. And what I think you want in a, a perfect tight end requires different teams to do different things against it. Right? There is not a tight end eraser on any football team. Like Derwin James might be the closest thing to it. And Derwin James try, you know, it, it, there's a reason guys like that always get hurt because it's too hard of a spot to play every single week. Like the, 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 a great tight end forces a defense to be weak, you know? So like, I think about, you know, back when I was growing up in Minnesota, they would, you know, uh, the Vikings struggled so much on tight ends. And one year, Mike Tice, you know, your, your, yeah. your friend from Atlanta, he figured out one year that, and I think, did Brian Williams play for you guys when you were a GM yeah. or was he gone by that? So yeah. Brian Williams was a corner who was physical. And one year, Mike Tice just learned that Brian Williams could cover tight ends pretty well. So then he put him inside and played like some slappy corners on the outside and they stopped giving up 100 yards a game to a tight end. But guess what? They started giving up 100 yard games to wide receivers because you had to take a good player and play him over tight ends. And you know, I think about like, what were the Eagles supposed to do last night with Kelsey? Well, I thought they might put James Bradbury on him because the Giants put James Bradbury on him mm -hmm. last year when they faced the Chiefs, and he did really well. But that weakens the spot. You have to take your best safety and play him down, or you take your best linebacker and play him down. But that weakens other parts of your defense. If, you're, if your tight end is one of these really good players in the, in the, in the passing game, it weakens the defense because there is not a good matchup for a tight end. They're too big for, for safeties yeah. um, or too fast for linebackers and too physical for corners. Like it's just not, it's not going to work. And that's why that position is so valuable when you find the great one, but that's why the great ones are so hard. And I, I want to get to this point because I think there's a couple really structural, and this is the Sumer sports part of this whole thing. When we're team building, there's some structural parts of the position that make it tough. And let me read off the first round picks at the tight end position over the past, let's say decade plus. So you have Kyle Pitts, you have Noah Fant, TJ Hawkinson, Hayden Hurst, David Njoku, Evan Ingram, OJ Howard, Eric Ebron, Tyler Eifert, Jermaine Gresham, and Brandon Pettigrew. Now those guys, none of those players suck. Like I actually think the majority of those players ended up being useful. But you think about the way it's gone. Noah Fant was already traded to Seattle. Mm -hmm. TJ Hawkinson made the Pro Bowl this year for the Vikings, not the team that drafted him. Hayden Hurst, you guys traded for him when you were a part of the Falcons mm -hmm. to pair. I think you paired him with Austin Hooper, if I'm not mistaken. And then um, Hurst then went to Cincinnati and has, has had a good career. Uh, you know, he made some big plays in the NFC title game. David Njoku, and actually – you know, we'll put this in the show notes. I'll, I'll link it to the to the podcast. I wrote an article about David Njoku when I was at PFF. He actually got an extension for the Browns that most people said he hasn't earned this, right? He hasn't done enough to do. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a, a young first round pick for the Browns, and he earned, he got an extension. He played great this year, right? The Browns actually were one of the first teams that said 
you know what? We made a mistake by drafting him in the first place, but we're not going to make the mistake of letting him go and blossom for another team like all these other tight ends. Did. <laughs> Evan Ingram had a great year for the Jaguars this year, uh, helping mm-hmm. helping out uh, Trevor Lawrence. Eric Ebron was better for the Steelers and Colts than he was for the, for the t- uh, Detroit Lions. On and on and on. The first problem with tight ends is it takes them forever to mature for all the reasons we're talking about. Because to be a great tight end, you have to have the blocking ability. You have to have the receiving ability. You have to have the, the physicality to stay on the field for 17 games. It's so hard, right? Like, would you, if you got a, if you got a chance to, you know, pull a, a, a magnet off the wall, as you said a few times this week, which I thought was a great phrase, pull a magnet off the wall again, would you ever take a tight end high? It feels like such a bad gamble right now. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I personally would love to do what, what Bill has done in the past too. I mean, if you can get... If you can get a really, really top end athlete at tight end, and then you get a six, so you get again an eight in our world is excellent, and you get a six, and you you pair those two guys back down to high percentage shots, creativity abound with two really good receivers, a third solid receiver. I I would I mean if I went back in, I would be pushing whoever was at the helm as a head coach to really look at what tight ends were out there, and and to your point. I don't believe you need to go as high. I used to always think the best place to take the tight ends were in the third round because I, you know, not, not that, not that Kyle Pitts isn't great. And again, one of the best pure athletes that has come out, but of course they didn't get a chance to use him a whole bunch this year. That's kind of stunted his growth. And I think he got injured. uh, I forget which game it was, right? That's a complicated situation, but look, I'm a, I'm a big tight end fan. I, I think it's, it's such a hard position to cover when you get, a big guy to your point. Brian Williams did a good job for us on it, of course, but it's just, it can be such a mismatch. And especially when these tight ends right now can be running high four fives, it's unbelievable what they yeah, can do. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, you also think about with the zone running games now that tight end has to be athletic, but they also have to be strong enough to actually man up on an, on an edge player, which as I talked about when you were gone, like when I was in college, you know, and I played division two as well, but like, that that edge player in a three four was just a small. It was a linebacker. That was easy to do. And the and in a four three, that guy was an edge, but he was playing six eyes, so you had help to your inside. Now you have these big Micah Parsons kind of players playing outside leverage on you, and you're trying to run outside zone as a tight end. You're going to get manhandled if you're not a real tight end uh, in this game. And then of course there are mismatch. Like if you if you can only play you know, Levine Toilolo on rundowns because he's the only guy that can actually seal an edge for you in the run game, then of course it takes away from your creativity as an offense because, you know, everybody knows that, hell, they're playing, they're playing their, somebody said Jason Dunn, which I thought was a good pullback back to the old, you know, uh, Chiefs days of uh, 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 Vermeil and, and uh, um, uh, Herm, Herm Edwards. But like, you know, you want that, the other part of the tight end, which is the flip side is, when you have a great one, the defense has to has to give away their tendencies. When you have not, you know, when you have kind of marginal guys, the offense has to give away theirs, and that that can that's the true wrinkle there. Okay. The the second, go ahead, yeah. Thomas. No, I was just going to say very quickly as we're talking about Levine Toloilo, when we picked him, I was convinced you'll get a kick out of this. I was so convinced that there was no one, no one out there that could could jump ball with a six eight basketball player from Stanford. With his vertical, I actually, I actually got uh, to know John Brankus pretty well, you know. And John, obviously, you know what he did with his, with his, uh, with his show. And I had him run quietly. I had him run all the digits on Levine Toloilo, and it basically came down to the linebacker had to have something like a forty-six inch vertical jump to even get close to Levine, Levine Toloilo, with even if he was jumping at a thirty-five. But I tried to convince. Matt Ryan and our tight end coach at the time, just jump ball the guy. What is the issue? They would not do it. And I feel bad for Levine because I thought we were going to hit on everything in the, in the red zone with him. I will say you guys ran some means, uh, what's it called? Leak with him though. I think the Seattle game that you got, did you guys lose that in the, you guys kill, you guys beat Seattle to sleep in the playoffs, but in the regular season, I think you lost there, but there was a play where he leaked, and he was wide open, like on you know, and, and that was the 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 offense that you guys had in sixteen was just so great, and 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 he was obviously a part of that along with Austin Hooper. Um, the second one I want to talk about is this idea of surplus value because 
this is the other reason why I think drafting tight ends high is often a difficult gamble. So when you look at Kyle Pitts, right? So Kyle Pitts went fourth overall in 2021. His initial contract was four years, 32.9 million. So a little over 8 million per year. That's a good, that's a good deal, right? You know, obviously if he becomes, you know, we look at the top of the market right now, just in terms of APY and you can get into, you know, structure and everything is Darren Waller at three years, 51 million. So 17 million APY. So you are getting, let's assume that Kyle Pitts become, let's, let's give him the best possible projection. So he becomes the best tight end in all of football. And he's worth what Darren Waller is worth on the field, which is 17 million to your team. We're calling that football value here. The net value between him and the rookie contract is, you know, 17 minus eight. So you're talking about $9 million essentially. That's a pretty good surplus. Like nine million is not that. That can get you a slot corner. That can get you a guard. That can that can get you something, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But contrast that with a truly premium position. Um, a well, a Dar- a guy like Darren Waller is often available in free agency. As your as your friend Belichick knows, you can get guys like John U. Smith. You can get guys like Hunter Henry in free agency uh, and through trades in many cases. Although trades, you can get wide receivers through trades. But let's assume all these positions are accessible in free agency. Jamar Chase, who was picked to pick later that year, pick five by the Bengals, four years, 30.8 million. So a little bit under 8 million per year. Let's assume Jamar Chase, and he's been this, is a top of the market wide receiver on the field. Well, that's Tyree Kill at four years, 120 million. And you can say whatever, like it's a funny money, 30 million a year, but let's use it for now. That's 22 million in surplus value, which is more than twice that of the tight end position, right? So the other part about picking tight ends high is the fact that even if they're the greatest ever, you can't, when you, if you try to turn around and get that guy in free agency, it's a lot cheaper relative to the rookie deal than it would be wide receiver. If you can hit on a wide receiver, that guy's worth almost twice as much relative to a rookie contract as a tight end is, which again, and that's true for guards. That's true for running backs. That's true for linebackers. Less so now that linebackers are making more money, but that's the other part about, you know, premium positions and draft, you know, strategy that I think some teams, you know, and and you talked about this, how you didn't necessarily agree with the Falcons taking pits that high, you know, it's not even, we think about evaluation of players, right? And we, we look at how hard that is, but just playing the draft well, not taking certain positions high, just because the the money's never going to work in your favor when you take a tight end that high versus taking another position. Yeah. You know, you get into that mode when you're, when you're picking and you know, you need something. I've said this time and again, and no one should ever forget it. We are so driven by need. Sometimes we trip over ourselves because we, we lose track of what you're talking about, right? Come hell or high water. We are getting the best damn guard or the best tight end that we, and and we salivate when we see some of these guys that we think is going to take us to the spot. Right. And, and remember just to bring it back a little bit, we're talking about the guys who can move, the guys who can catch the balls and, and be mismatches. But we we can't underestimate the importance of having an adept enough blocker. And again, the, the first rounders, remember, everyone's a guy that can move like that, but also is a, at least a good blocker, right? At least a six blocker in, in our mm-hmm. grading scale. You're rarely going to find someone who's a seven and a seven, meaning athletic ability, pure receiver, seven or an eight. And, and a seven or eight blocker. That is very, very rare. I don't know where they come from, but the, the reality is if you can pair them both, as I mentioned before, it's important. I love your analogy and, and your discussion on the surplus because it comes back to that, the value of that and being able to find someone in the third round or even as a free agent that you're not going to pay out your ears for. That's a pretty cool thing. I Look, yeah. when, when, when Hooper left us, we were back and forth whether we wanted Hoop to stay with us I could tell that he was, he was, he was sort of, he had this urge to kind of get out there and spread his wings and it, it all worked. We were all good with it. Goes to Cleveland. How many years was he there? Two? Yeah. Two years in Cleveland. Yeah. He got paid pretty well too. He got paid pretty well. Left. It was only two years, of course. I think, I don't know. They signed him for a one year deal in Tennessee. Right. I think that's what it was. So, yeah. but look, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it is a great position to discuss. It's a great pitch position for any of you, have any of you aspiring team builders it is so right and you you will not have a hard time convincing any of your coaches along the way of the importance of this 
in my mind. It's just, it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a legit place to be. The, the last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up, cause I know, you know, we want to keep these Monday ones short for the, for the crowd here, but like the other part that I think is tough is how hard is it to, to draft for a position that in the NFL is drastically different than in most of college football. So you had this, and maybe you can expound on this. Remember the Manny Lawson draft where the Niners took Manny Lawson and he was like the only college three, four outside linebacker that played what a three, four outside linebacker in the NFL would at the time. Like back then, almost all division one colleges played four, three funny, all division two played three, four because we didn't have the athletes to play that, you know, that way. And it, it, things have evolved, of course, that it made it easier. You can you can find guys that are stand-up guys now. But tight end, it's like – and I have a funny story. So when I, when I was in college, there was a guy that played with me who played X. He played wide receiver, but he was about my size. He's like 6'4", 220. And I always asked him, I'm like, buddy, like, why aren't you coming to play tight end with me? He goes, Eric, if 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 they made me play tight end, I'd just go play division one tight end. Because that – you know, I, I'm playing here because I want to play wide receiver. I'm like, oh, that, you know, that kind of an insult, but okay, let's, you know, <laughs> and I, I I think now to like NIL and I think about, you know, the movement that guys have and with rare exceptions, the guys that are athletic enough to, to be that, that receiver type that you need in, in the, in college football, they're maybe good enough to play wide receiver in, in a different school. And so they might not be willing to stay and develop as a tight end in a school that would play them as such like Iowa or Maryland or something like, and, or Nebraska, you know, places like that. And then the guys that are staying in places like Iowa and, and so forth are not necessarily the athletes. I mean, we got Kittle and we got uh, Hawkinson. So there, there has happened, but like the pickings are slim as far as looking at a guy. So it's, it's purely a projection. And so when I think for myself, you know, when I'm an analytics guy, I'll look at obviously athleticism, I'll look at production, I'll look at some you know tracking data and things like that. But for the most part, no one's checking my boxes analytically, right? So it's almost mm. in at that position, you're almost entirely looking at a scout's ability to translate with his or her mind, the college production, the college traits to the NFL traits. Can you just talk about how difficult that that projection is? It, it's a complicated projection, although I think, you know, we all take pride in being able to, to, to do this projection thing, right? When we see people move around, when we see people, you know, be able to have a base and have a strength about them, being able to turn quickly and wall off. When you're starting to project the ability to, to block, right? Sometimes it, it might even be on bag work with us. I know it sounds odd, um, but sometimes you have to go as far as projecting that way. Remember, Again, another tough thing, as we say, on any blocking element, O-line as well. We've talked about this because of the rule changes. It is a little bit of a slow change. So your projection there is you're finding a guy that has the want. Like I said earlier, put probably in front of it or right in line with that want and that desire to get better. But also is, is that, that acute awareness and the football intelligence that you truly need. They don't all need to be PhDs in mathematics, uh, Eric, but – you know what I'm saying there. Like there are so many elements that we look at as we are projecting. Sometimes we hit on it and sometimes we don't. It is complicated. It is complicated. But the ones who work out, of course, are the ones who have the special traits about them, but also have the drive. And I know this is not analytical, but who have the drive and who have the focus to want to get better and want to, you know, and have the resiliency to get their asses knocked around, get mm -hmm. back up and, and, and get back on the line and learn. Yeah, it, it, it was such an adjustment for me having played high school wide receiver and stuff. Just even like, I love the part about you're involved in every play. I love the part of, you know, when you're wide receiver, you're stock blocking on some plays. But if you're the backside of a run play, you're basically irrelevant unless a guy breaks a run off. You're always involved in the play. I always thought that was cool because that always kept me, my brain engaged in the whole game. But you're also never like my, you know, I, I always used to tell my offensive line coach, I'm like, I actually like pass protecting. He goes, Eric, you're a mismatch when you pass protect. So I don't like you pass protecting. And it was like, and, and it was, and you're a mismatch in the run game too. And, and like the whole, you're always sort of on the boundary of what you're supposed to be doing that it does take some mental toughness as far as like, right. In that position to be able to play it properly, because 
you're always in this weird if you're blocking a corner like okay do i do i block a corner in such a way that it's always go, like a pancake's gonna look like a hold so do, how do i do that without looking like a you know uh a wussy right like yeah. and how do you and how do you you know do you cut on the back side of of zone or do you do like all these questions that like are awkward when you play that position because you are differently sized than everybody else. You're smaller than the defensive lineman mm -hmm. and you're bigger than all the defensive backs and linebackers you go against. It, it, it was a very interesting uh, position and it did take some like mental fortitude to play. Oh yeah. I look, and just so everyone knows uh, many, many times and in, in percentages, I wouldn't be able to give it to you, but tight ends in the pros, I'm sure they do it in college as well. They would spend their time in the O line room, right? Oh, and, and they would spend time learning, of course, the run game and learning the scheme and learning blocking elements, as well as being out on the field for positions. You know, you'd always see the tight ends go down there and hang out with the O-line for a while and then come back, of course, a really important thing to note. And if I can say this before, as we're tailing off here, I know I mentioned it or alluded to it a little bit earlier, Matt growing, it was good to have a guy like Tony Gonzalez, but was also really, really interesting. There's no disrespect to Matt Ryan because Matt, you did great stuff for us. But you also had some of those struggling games. And when we knocked off a game and we started going early on and we got a feel where, uh-oh, this is not, not going to be one of Matt's games. Let's reel it back. Let's pull it back. We started pulling back a little bit, hitting those underneath shots. Tony Gonzalez for us, not only because it was Tony Gonzalez, but it was also because he was an adept tight end, was a guy that could bring a quarterback back to his senses, settle down a little bit. Let's start hitting these big high percentage shots to a guy like that who could not only catch it, turn around and get two or three more yards. To me, he was such a godsend for us. It was so bad. It was, it was too bad that he was not able to win a Super Bowl. Yeah, for sure. And, and um, it is. And I, you know, one thing I like about Tony Gonzalez is how supportive he's been of Travis Kelsey, who, you know, obviously plays for the same franchise as he played for and, and has, and has risen to, to new heights. And, you know, it's, it's weird. We had that tight end, uh, b bumper crop, right? When you had Gates and Heath Miller and Algie Crumpler and, and um, you know, then it was Gronk and Hernandez. And then it was, you know, we had, you know, Jimmy Graham and you had, and now you don't have that as much, right? You have like, you know, I think Andrews is an A plus guy. I think Goddard's an A plus guy. Somebody talked about Dalton Schultz kind of had a down year on the franchise tag. And obviously Kelsey's the best of them all, Darren Waller. It's a smaller group now. That's, that's really good. And, I wonder if any league changes or anything like that will make it so that that position is more it grows back to where it was in kind of the two thousands where, I mean, the battle for the pro bowl berths was just, you know, fierce so when Jason Witten, right. You yeah. had all these great players at the position and now it's a little bit, it's a little bit hollowed out there. Uh, I'm very interested to see because look, you're trying to, you're seeing some teams as, I, as we finish up here that are trying to use like guys like Zach Pascal, the Eagles to be that backside blocker on, on plays as a wide receiver. Robert Woods did that for the Rams and now the Titans and you're seeing wide. And I just don't know real Robert Woods has been injured for two years. Like I don't know if you want to try to patch up what tight ends do with what, with wide receivers because of how much money you're investing in that position too. And how injury prone it can be when you try to get those guys, you know, like Cooper cup blocking against the defensive end. Like I don't really want my $25 million in circulation blocking defensive ends all that much uh, at his size. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you know, it, it, I think that there'll be a comeback here. I think with more too high shells and that kind of thing, because you know, the, the real thing that caused the tight end to explode in the early 2000s was how good, you know, the Lovey Smith and the uh, Monty Kiffin, the cover two, that the split field safeties, having a tight end that could run down that middle, that basically killed the cover two uh, it, it, as, as the dominant defense in the NFL. I, I do wonder now that we're seeing more too high shells again, do we see the tight end position becoming a, a more prominent position in the NFL uh, or, or, or do we stay along the path that we are going on with where it's basically Kelsey, a couple other guys and, and kind of a bunch of specialists. It's a great dialogue and I can't wait to continue to talk about it as this leads into the draft, right? Because we'll yeah. be, we'll be talking about some guys that I think, you know, there's some special ones, of course. And every year I love watching some of those guys that I see more in that mid round. I just can't, you know, that three, four, three, four, five area where you can, you can develop those guys. If you have the right development element in your coaching staff or amongst your coaching staff, I think that's a, that's a really big place to, to make your money on it and have a good value, of course. Yeah. Well, this has been fun. Uh, really fun recap of the Super Bowl uh, with you, Thomas, and really fun talking tight ends. 
Uh, we're going to talk running back next week, uh, the running back, um, which, which will be great. Uh, no running back on a Super Bowl winning team has had a cap hit of over two and a half million dollars in the last 10 years. Uh, so that that'll be an interesting discussion topic uh, for next week uh, with Isaiah Pacheco having a you know a seventh round pick being the Super Bowl champion running back this year. Um, but it, it'll there's that's a great position is to, to do uh, as well as tight end. So uh, I'm really excited for that. So um, until then time, we'll be back Wednesday. We're going to talk, uh, you know, broader NFL Wednesday, get into the off season, take some suggestions from listeners as well. We really appreciate you all showing up. Remember subscribe, rate and review, um, write a review on Apple podcasts. Give us five stars. Please help the podcast grow. So for Thomas Dimitrov, this has been Eric eager. This has been episode 29 of the Sumer sports show.